Welcome back to my garden. I'm Liz Davey, and this is a walk in the garden, a series of, on NCTV, Norfolk Community Cable Television, in beautiful Norfolk, Massachusetts. And I'm in my garden, and it is dry. It's the middle of September, and we haven't had a good rain for quite a long time. Hopefully, we've got one coming up in a couple of days, but uh, lately they've been going either north or south, and missing us entirely. My herb garden is really dry. This is an area I haven't been able to water. We have water bands in town, and as a town water user, I've been very selective with plants that I water, mostly using the water on the vegetable garden. But I do have some herbs that have prospered, and most of the herbs are at least usable at this point. It is fall, so they're starting to wane. This morning, it was in the 40s, so that means it's coming, and it's time to start getting ready for fall and winter. One of the things I can do is pick some of the non-edible herbs, and this is a southern wood, and then I have rue right here. Uh, rue is a plant that if you have allergy problems, you might want to wear gloves when you pick it because the sap from it can cause some skin irritation, burning. I don't, so I will use it, but uh, it's something to be careful. And then I have some tansy over here. Very dry, but it is still here. And I'm going to make a little bouquet with uh, the rubber band I have around my wrist. And this will be good to put in my shed or in the garage or any place that you might have insects and mice, and it will help keep them out of the area. May not be 100%, but it does help a lot. And if you have a little corner that the mice like to get into, or that uh, moths are prevalent, then this is a good thing to use. It's natural, and you're not using an insecticide. It's a very, they're very aromatic herbs, so they do have quite a, uh, an odor. You can also add sweet annie to this mixture which is one that just comes up in my vegetable garden. I planted it once and now it comes up all over, as do a number of other things that we'll see later. It's time, unfortunately, to start preparing for fall. And if you have plants in the garden that you wish to take inside, it's a good time to put them in the pot right now. This is a rosemary, and I wanna take that in for the winter to see if I can winter it over inside. Last year I was quite successful with that, and so this year I potted it up now. Rosemary will live and uh, be fine down to about 20 degrees. So frost doesn't kill it right away. Then you can leave it out a while in the pot so that it gets acclimated to being potted. The other thing we can do is collect herbs and seeds. Many of the herbs I've already collected when they were in a little better condition. I've dried some and frozen a few of them. Uh, sage is still available, and you can pick sage right up through Thanksgiving. It will live a long time. I have fennel here that's starting to go to seed, so I want to just put some of the tops into a paper bag and we want to save those seeds as they fall. They're starting to ripen. So I'll just put them in. Fennel foliage is still available. You can use that instead of dill, if you don't have any dill, and you like the taste, the anise taste of fennel. But I'll just keep this bag probably open on a cupboard inside until all of those seeds fall off of the plants. A few shakes every once in a while will help it along then you can keep those seeds over for the winter. When it comes to cutting back plants, I don't cut back too many. I will cut back a few seed pods that uh, might spread, although I think I'm a little late for some of them. 
But you definitely do not want to cut back any rose bushes now. Uh, spring is the time to prune those. And you don't want to cut back the southern wood and the lavenders. They need to stay where they are too. And the thyme can be, continue to be picked. But again, I don't cut that one back. It'll stay evergreen most all winter. So really there's very little to do to prepare for winter here except keep some of the leaves out of it if you can. And maybe take some cuttings of things like hardy of the tender geraniums. And this one is a nutmeg geranium. And I'll just take the tops off of that and we'll take some cuttings of that and plant them and then bring it inside for the winter so I'll have plants for next year. This year I wasn't able, thanks to COVID-19, to buy very many plants. Usually I go around and find herbs and annuals to put in my garden. This year I wasn't able to, so the cuttings that I took last fall have served me well in that I've been able to plant those in my garden. Now let's move over to the perennial garden. I'm here in the perennial garden and this end of the perennial garden really got no water at all, all season. It's good to look around and see the areas where you got no water or very minimal water, what actually looks pretty good. And that would be the boltonia that's in this garden. A lot of people mistake this for an aster, but it's really boltonia and it blooms about mid-September, mid to end of September. And it's looking okay. Uh, it's clearly pretty drought tolerant. Another one that's going to bloom soon is this Eupatorium chocolate. And that too seems to be quite drought tolerant. It has the dark foliage that has accented this end of the garden for uh, most of the summer. And now it'll have little white blooms on it as we go along. I've left the pods on the Boltonia just to add a little interest because a lot of the other plants here really haven't done quite as well as they usually do. The uh, Heliopsis, uh, the yellow sunflower, just really would have appreciated a lot more moisture. I do have a Montauk daisy here. I'm hoping for a few blooms on that. We'll see how that goes. Most of the plants are cut back of their blooms. I do deadhead most of the flowers. And you do deadheading or cutting off of spent blooms for several reasons. The first is to promote more bloom. And I had deadheaded this uh, plant and got a few more yellow blooms, small ones, but they are there. The other reason is to keep a plant from going to seed if you don't want more of it. There are some thugs in the garden that will spread all over the place if you don't take the seed heads off. And the third reason is to tell the plant that it's winter and that winter is coming and it's time to slow down and get ready. Another reason would be for birds and that's where some of the seed pods come in. I have a uh, goldenrod here and this is just a regular goldenrod and I discovered in my garden that I have and around my garden in some of the wilder areas that I have uh, about five different varieties of goldenrod. Who knew? One of the things I have is on my cell phone, I have an app that will help me identify flowers. And basically you just take a picture of what you wish to identify and it pops up with what it is and all kinds of information about it. There are several different apps. I'm not gonna advertise for anyone. But it's worth looking into if you enjoy plants and really want to know what your plants are, and especially your weeds. It's sometimes nice to know what's a plant and what's a weed, and also what is an invasive species so that you can be sure to remove it. It's been a lot of fun for me this summer while we've been in quarantine to go out and find out what's growing around my property and on my property and even some of the walking trails around Norfolk. Asters are just about to bloom and they've done extremely well with the drought. Many of the plants I will not cut back for winter. I used to cut back the whole garden, start with a fresh palette every spring, but then I read that 
a lot of beneficial insects and butterfly, uh, butterfly larvae and chrysalises are formed on the dead stalks of the plants in your garden. If you remove those stalks, you remove the butterflies and beneficial insects. So I try to leave many of them. There are a few, however, that I really can't stand out to look at all winter. And that would be, one of them is daylilies, which get these pot, uh, straggly leaves. And those I will remove completely throughout the garden. The other one would be Siberian iris, which I will cut down. Uh, I don't like the way that winter's over. It's hard to remove in the spring. And most of the irises I will again cut back. I've already cut back a few of them here and there in the garden. And those will be cut back too. Other than that, plants will stay standing until spring. They add a little interest, especially the ornamental grasses. And they provide a home for some of the smaller creatures of the garden. Moving down this way, I've had a few plants that uh, came out in flower pots. And this is a eucomus or pineapple lily. And that's one that will soon be going up to my back porch. We'll wait until the uh, foliage browns down a bit. And then this will be stored in a cool room over the winter and foliage will ultimately be removed from it. And it will send up new bloom stalks in the spring. I'll get it out, give it a little water, I'll keep it dry all winter, and it will bloom. This is about its fifth year, so it's doing pretty well. As far as water goes, what you really need to water would be roses. This is a rose. And any clematis that you have, climbing clematis, I have a brand new one over here. And also anything that you put in recently, any perennial or a tree or a shrub. If you've planted them this year, you need to make sure to keep them watered throughout the season and see that they go into the winter well hydrated. If we don't start getting some rain, that will be very important to anything that's new in your garden. Collecting more seeds. This is butterfly weed. We had lovely purple blossoms most of the summer. And now we have these lovely seed pods and the fluff that's attached to each seed. This helps it spread. But I'm going to collect these so that I can share them or plant some in the spring. So basically it's just a matter of putting them into a paper bag. And then on a nice winter day, separating the seeds from the fluff. That's the hardest part, but it really doesn't take too long. A lot of them, uh, if you give the bag a good shake, will fall to the bottom of the bag. I'll also, when I do that, save the fluff. I found that uh, birds enjoy this, the fluffy part that attaches to the seed pod as nesting material. It makes a nice soft bed for the baby birds. So, I save that and put it out in the spring. Doesn't take up much space, and they seem to appreciate it. Now I'm gonna move down to another area of the garden, and we still have a few things blooming where the garden did get a little runoff from watering the vegetable garden. For the most part, I've been watering new plants and anything that's in a pot. I keep some potted plants in the garden and on the patio, and they need water almost daily when we've had the high temperatures and low humidity conditions. Again, not going to cut too much back. I added a few annuals to the garden that came up in my vegetable garden. This is Cleome, and it's uh, attracting quite a few bumblebees and some honeybees today. Phlox is still blooming a little. I've been cutting that back because it tends to spread. So I cut back the flower stalks. I've saved the pods from the Siberian iris. These can be used in fall decorations, uh, inside floral de decorations, and also in Christmas decorations. Little spray paint kind of 
makes them a little more attractive. This is a plant I planted last year. This is its second year. I'm pleased with the way it's doing in spite of the drought. It is an ironweed, a New York ironweed, and this is a native plant, and it blooms in the fall. I'm leaving the seed pods of the uh, monarda or bee balm. Again, something the birds will enjoy. We have Autumn Joy Sedum back here. This uh, started out a pale green, and then it became this lovely pink, and it's on its way to a dark, dark burgundy. And I will leave this alone, and uh, these will stay in the garden pretty much all winter. They can be picked and again used as winter decorations, and they dry quite well, so they can be used as dried flowers later on. So we don't pick everything that we're going to do. Over here, I have a few late balloon flowers. This was covered at one point. These two tend to spread pretty well, so I have been taking off any spent blooms, and they forced a couple more to come out. My peony now is looking pretty sad. This is one I'll cut back as well. It has uh, some mildew on it. That's a reminder not to compost things that are diseased. This one would possibly spread the spores of the fungal infection to other things. It happens when the uh, weather is hot and humid, and the last few weeks that's what we've had. So I have some mildew on it, and when I cut this one back, I will trash the leaves from it and not add it to my compost pile. The black-eyed Susans are really a favorite with the uh, yeah, smaller birds. The goldfinches particularly love them. Often I'll see a lot of goldfinches out, so I'll definitely leave the seed heads on that one for them. Now I think we can move down to the vegetable garden. And we're gonna look at that in two different areas because it's gotten to be quite a jungle in there. This end of the garden held the peas earlier in the season, and they've been removed, and I did plant a few more just in case we might get a few snow peas. It depends when we get our first frost. Average first frost, and that means 32 degrees, is September 25th, and that's coming up pretty fast. However, a lot of the things in the garden will not be killed by 32 degrees. It will take a little colder than that. 32 degrees is for tropicals and some of the very tender things. So you have a little more time, but it's time to start thinking about getting ready. I've been picking a lot from my garden, and some of the things that I have include tomatoes and uh, golden beets, and I've got a third crop of radishes going. You can plant radishes about every month and have a constant supply if you like them sliced in your salad, and we do. I also have peppers to pick. I'll pick one of those right here. I've had some fairly good peppers this year, which is new for me. Uh, I have treated them well, and they have produced. I also have arugula. In, and again, I've planted several plantings of arugula throughout the season. I have some lettuce. More cilantro, we are cilantro lovers here. You either love it or hate it, we love it. So I plant that several times over the season. This will be my last planting. There's some dill. It's starting to go to seed, but still can be used in some late pickles. Perpetual spinach. Perpetual spinach is a charred relative. I also have some Swiss chard up here. And this can be used exactly as you'd use spinach. I have planted some new spinach, and this spinach requires cool weather. Perpetual spinach will live on through the summer. You can pick it all summer and use it and have spinach all summer. Hopefully we have enough good weather left, not too hot, that my row of spinach will mature. I also have planted a little more lettuce, and there's some dill coming up that can be used for dill weed. And I will need to keep these watered 
hence I have the hose out. So I'll still be out watering so that I can get a crop from these. They need to be kept moist so that they will mature fairly quickly. I did add compost to the planting area when I planted the seeds for the late crops because the soil was probably depleted by earlier crops. So a little extra compost helps keep some moisture in and also gives the plants some nutrients. I removed half a row of strawberries after the strawberries were finished. We had a good year for strawberries. I was able to pick quite a few, but the plants are getting old and they're showing their age. They're not putting out as many runners, so I removed half of them. The space that's left, this year I will plant garlic. Next spring where I'm standing, I'll put some new strawberries to fill in. Hopefully we'll get a few berries off of the old crop next year because the new crop will need to have the blossoms removed for one year to set up good plants. Strawberry plants will last for three or four years with a good supply of berries, but they do need to be replanted periodically in order to get the best berries that you can have. The tomatoes have been very good. I planted, and uh, not necessarily intentionally, a few more of these uh, small tomatoes than I had intended. I guess I got my plant labels a little mixed up because I have a lot of these, but they've proved to be very good for drying in the, and I've been drying them and also for fresh eating. So we've, we've enjoyed them. Though I think I would like more of the main season tomatoes. We've had enough, but not any extra to can. You notice the purple flowers that are in bloom all over the garden. This is amaranth and this is a Hopi dye amaranth. It's a plant that can be used for dyeing fabric. And actually, the seeds can be used as a grain. I don't harvest it. I grow it purely because I like the looks of it. And I don't, act, in fact, did not plant it this year. I planted it about six years ago. And now, because it does go to seed, it comes up throughout the garden in the spring. So I know by leaving these plants to mature and go to seed, I will have amaranth all over the garden next year. It's easy to pull out in the spring and I will be doing quite a bit of it because I've enjoyed just having it in the garden for flower arrangements. It's a really nice addition to a flower arrangement. It turns the water a little pink, but it's, it's a pretty plant. Maybe some year I will harvest the seed and see what it's like and look up some information about it. Amaranth is a grain crop in some parts of the world. I have a lot of, of zinnias right now, and they're a really cheerful flower that is very easy to grow. Uh, it's kind of overtaking my row of herbs where I have some uh, basil. I planted three different kinds of basil this year, and we've enjoyed that. Uh, I will be preserving that to keep some of it for the winter as pesto or in water-filled ice cubes and also dried. I can, I've been hanging bunches of dried flowers and dried uh, herbs in order to have dried things. My cucumbers are just about gone. If we get some good rain, we might get a couple more cucumbers. I have one that's growing outside the fence right now and that needs to be picked soon. I have parsley and I've had dill and cilantro, so herbs in this garden too. The herbs that are down here are the annual herbs that grow better in the sun than they do in the shade. My herb garden is starting to get a little more shade than it really should have, so I grow those here in the fall sun. Now I'm going to have the cameraman come down to the other end of the garden so that I can show you what's growing there. We seem to have so much in the middle that it's hard to see both ends. I'm at this end of the garden and as you can see, it's, it's pretty full. This is lemon basil. It's one of the uh, five types of basil. I have opal basil and also some Thai basil, which is a little spicier. In front of that would be parsnips, which will be harvested after a good frost or two or three. They will last actually until next spring, but I will be picking them 
probably in about November. I reached behind here just now and picked some kale. I still have plenty of kale. I'm going to freeze some of that to use in soup all winter and other dishes that we like with kale. It freezes quite well. These are Brussels sprouts. The sprouts are starting to form along the stem. They're tiny right now. And so in early September, I cut off the tops. And you can see uh, the, the growing point. And this hopefully will force the energy to go into the sprouts instead of trying to grow taller. In the near front are some lima beans. And those are terribly slow. They're just starting to form pods now. Further down are some green beans. Still getting a few, but they're mostly gone for the season. Throughout the garden, I have flowers that have just come up, like the amaranth. I have nasturtiums, some I planted, and some just came up from seed that fell last year. The tall plants in the middle here are tomatillos. And I started growing those last year. And last year I didn't support them, and so they completely covered the ground in a portion of the garden. This is a tomatillo. It's hard and a little sticky, but it makes great salsa and a couple chicken dishes, and it freezes fairly well too. Just uh, freezing them as it were. Little paper covering splits when they're ripe and turns a lighter brown. They come in smaller sizes probably than you'd get in the southwest, but we could still enjoy them. It's a plant, these are three plants, and I did put them in some supports this year so that they wouldn't be all over the ground. And they will give us plenty of tomatillos for salsa to freeze and to share. I also have some cabbages down here, a few in with the Brussels sprouts, and up further in the garden are some, is some broccoli, and the broccoli, if you take out the main head that forms in the middle of the plant and leave the plant, you will usually get side shoots that come up and form smaller heads so that you can uh, continue to pick broccoli right up through Thanksgiving if you leave it in your garden. So don't take your broccoli down. My squash has gotten a bit of mildew on it. Again, I will make sure those plants don't go in the compost, uh, but are trashed. I'm still getting a few blossoms. Whether we'll get more zucchini and yellow squash pretty much depends on the weather. Some of the plants have already decided to quit, and so I pull those out and get rid of them as they go. Again, we watch the beans, and. Uh, keep picking and the cabbages too will stay in the garden for quite a long time even after we have a small frost. The first things to go will be the flowers and the zinnias and the marigolds and the nasturtiums particularly will fall in a heap once we get the cooler temperatures and then they can be removed. It will give us a little more space in the garden, in this end of the garden. Now it's time to go back into the shade garden. The time has come to take cuttings of plants that I want to have next year. And I'm going to start by taking pieces of the plant, and I take the ends of the plant. And I'm going to reach over here on this one and uh, cut it below a node. A node is where the leaves are coming out. I'm going to take about three of those. This is a Plectoranthus, and it uh, is a nice plant for adding just a, a gray background to the plants. And I've got some geraniums, and this is a uh, Tradescantia. And again, these are all annuals, and I'd like to have them available next year so I can uh, plant them again. These large plants started out as little cuttings last year. I also have another Plectoranthus type which has a blue flower, and you can see the flower stalk on it. For doing a cutting, I'm going to cut the flowering part off. And again, I have a few more of those in this, this planter. This planter was done entirely with cuttings, and also a bulb, which is a canna, 
This is the canna that's in bloom. That's a bulb that I will take in. But in order to do cuttings, you'll cut your material and then right underneath where these leaves come out, cut off any blooms. I'll take off the leaves and cut it just underneath the area where the leaves have come out. We'll do it with these three, even if there's multiple leaves and they will branch once they're, they're cut. We want to be right underneath a node. If I cut it up too high, it may not form any roots. I've filled some pots with compost and I have a product called a rooting hormone, which though not necessary, does speed rooting. And I do want to pour some into a little container. You don't want to contaminate the whole can by dipping in it. I'm going to dip the uh, base of each of these into the rooting powder, about a quarter of an inch. And then I can put three in each of these pots. And in order to make a hole for them, I have uh, watered these pots a little bit, but not a lot. So I'm going to make three holes using a pencil and then put in my cutting and firm it. Again, we've missed a bloom. And I'll do this with uh, many other things too. It goes pretty fast once you have your material picked and cleaned and ready. Again with the plectoranthus, we'll cut it off right below the node, dip it into the rooting powder, and put it into one of the holes in the pot. Now it's important to keep these well watered and in a semi-shady spot, which is where I am, you may lose a few leaves. And not all of them will root. This one I'm going to go a little higher because there's a good node right here. And again, put it in and firm it down. Once these start to grow, then you can start pinching out the uh, tops and they will we'll do a geranium too. Any type of geranium you can do this with. Geraniums root quite easily. There's a leaf there. These happen to be uh, rose geraniums. And again, cut it right below the little node because that's where the roots will form. Firm it in well. And do I have another one? Yes. I will continue adding things to this tray. I can also try lavender and uh, rosemary and see if I can get those to root as well. I'll have at least one tray, maybe two, of cuttings. They won't all grow, and when they don't grow, why well, you just pluck them out. If they do grow and you have three in a container, then you need to divide them a little later along the way, probably in October, November, even December and put them in individual pots. These will stay out as long as the weather permits and then they'll go inside and be under my plant lights for the rest of the winter. Or at least in a sunny window. Again, if they grow very successfully, you can pinch those and take new cuttings from these plants and you'll have plenty of plants to put in your planters next year. Uh, again, I bought very few plants this year. I uh, did buy uh, 
verbena. This is a red verbena, which has bloomed pretty well all summer. This I grew from a cutting. This is a, a succulent that has red blossoms on it. And I'll take cuttings of that one again for sure because it has done very well. And then the alyssum I planted from seed. So you really don't need to spend a lot of money if you take cuttings. You'll have uh, things to use next year in your garden. Now let's head back for a few minutes to the pond area. This is my shade garden and uh, it's done fairly well considering the hostas are starting to look a little uh, shabby at this point in the game. And this is uh, leftover foliage from a bleeding heart and that gets cut back. It's gone. When things uh, really start to look bad down here, I do clip them off. I clip back a little more down here in the winter and fall because uh, I have been known to have quite a bit of damage from slugs. And slugs love to hide in old foliage. So some of it will stay. The, some of them are evergreen or semi-evergreen. And of course they will not be cut back. But things like this that will just get browner and not add to the seen at all, get cut back. They will come back next spring, so be aware of them. If you planted something new this year and cut it back, you might want to put a label on it so that you don't dig it up next year by mistake, forgetting that you put it there. I have quite a few hosta. Again, once they turn brown, I will remove the foliage of those. The ferns just melt away on their own. You don't really have to do much at all with them. And the helibores will stay evergreen. These are helibores. They will stay evergreen and bloom very early in the spring. But these can be added to the compost. Now I'm going to walk down towards the pond. Pond has done well this year and I had worried about my plants that I'd kept inside over the winter. I wasn't sure they were going to make a good show. I have uh, three elephant ears that I brought outside. And those plants have done extremely well with a little water, fertilizer, and a, the bit of sun that they get. They've really developed. I will be bringing those in probably within the next couple weeks. I hate to disturb them because they do not do extremely well inside. I'm lucky if I can keep them alive. <coughs> but I know they'll die if I leave them in the pond all winter. The fish, on the other hand, will stay in the pond all winter and be happy, hopefully, and start moving very slow. It's time to change to a fall feed, and it's also time to put in my water thermometer. And once the temperature drops below about 50 in the water, I will switch to a fall spring food, which is kind of prepares them for the winter or helps them come out of their dormancy-like state that they're in in the winter when they get no food at all. I'll stop feeding completely when the pond is about 40 or even a little less. Again, I'll go by whether they come up to get food or not, how much I give them. They'll eat less, generally, as the fall proceeds. But the pond thermometer will just go down in the water and be hooked onto the, one of the filters. The other thing I'll have ready for the pond is a net and I use an old tripod that I have left from a sprinkler that stopped working but I kept the tripod and that can go in the middle of the pond to hold the net up off the water and help the leaves that fall from all these trees that are around the pond stay out of the water and that'll go up about the end of the month or when I start seeing a lot of leaves coming down and that can be any time it varies by the year I'm starting to see a few already, and I have to clean my uh, skimmer a little more often. And once it gets really bad, then I put the net on. And I'll leave the net on through leaf fall. Once the leaves are totally off the trees, I do take it off and store it away. Over the winter, I had stored these. These were, I've stored these for several winters. 
And this year, having a little more time due to COVID and staying home, I had time to get out these gourds that I grew a number of years ago and get them painted. And so I've got these all ready to hang up next year as little birdhouses. And speaking of birdhouses, the birds are finished with them. So it's time to take them down and store them away. Beware when you open a birdhouse that's been used, has a nest in it, because once the birds move out, the mice sometimes move in. I opened one the other day and was very surprised when a mouse jumped out. So open your birdhouses with caution, especially if you're on a ladder, which fortunately I was not. Birdhouses uh, that are left out, if you can leave them open so the mice don't take up residence, it's a good idea. And speaking of mice, I will be adding some of those herbs to my shed, as well as some uh, a mint product, which discourages the mice. I never truly keep them completely out. There's many ways they can get in, unfortunately. I don't like to use chemicals because I do have a pet. This is a begonia that has just exceeded my expectations all summer. It's one plant, and I, it, it's a leftover from last year. Once it died down and I took the foliage off, I stored this in the cool room in my house, one that we don't heat much in the winter. And this summer it started sprouting and came back and has bloomed constantly since the end of May. On the other hand, I usually plant and have pots of impatiens. Generally, there's a big pot of them on the pond, and there was for most of the summer, as well as this pot. You can see they have completely disintegrated. I believe this is some sort of fungus or virus of the impatiens. I will not be saving seeds from these plants. Usually I save my seeds. I'll start with fresh seed next year, and these plants, again, will be discarded so that uh, we try not to spread the virus any further or bacterial disease any further. The, the humid weather has not helped with that sort of thing. Again, I have a few more flowers in here. These are bulbs, caladium bulbs. And again, these can be, and this one was used last year, stored away in peat moss during the winter in a cool spot and planted in the spring. And they add some color to planters and the garden. So mixing it up, I was able to fill all the planters I had intended by planting a few seeds, using some bulbs, and the cuttings that I had. Now let's head up on the porch and see a little bit about preparing your house plants to go inside. I usually buy annuals to fill in this area in front of my back windows. Well, this year, things were a little different. I was able to get a few, again, some verbena, and that's the white flowers. There are two verbena in here, and also these pentas, and these I grew from cuttings last year. It was an experiment to take cuttings. I didn't know if they would grow successfully or not, but I found that they certainly did, and not only do I have a full big plant of pentas, but I had enough cuttings that I could plant them in here, and they've been blooming pretty regularly. The other thing I put in here were a couple hot peppers that I grew from seed. These are jalapenos and this is, I'm not sure which kind, but it's another hot pepper. And uh, so I've been picking those and we've been enjoying them. So I was able to fill the spot without buying a lot of annuals. All the plants up here again are from cuttings or left from last year. My bougainvillea comes out every summer and spends the summer. Then it goes in in the winter, and it doesn't look great in the spring, but it quickly seems to recover. I've had this plant probably for 25, maybe, yeah, about 25 years, and it's starting to bloom again. It too can take some frost, but not a lot, so it's going to have to be brought in fairly soon. Getting plants ready to bring in, you need to be kind of careful, and. Uh, this is a clivia, and it just finished this bloom, and I'm going to cut off the bloom stalk, and we'll discard that. And then, uh, as with all of these plants, and I don't have any water on right now, but I'll give them a good spray of water. 
This will knock off anything, any insects that are on it. You want to try not to bring insects inside. It's hard to get rid of. They tend to proliferate indoors if you bring them in and you have a hard time getting rid of them. So if you can get rid of them before you bring them in, it's a lot better. So I'll spray every plant extremely well. It would be nice if we had a little rain to help. And then I'll spray them with neem oil. And neem oil will kill anything that's residual or just about. And then in a couple weeks, I'll be sure to check them again and spray again if necessary, if it missed anything. So I buy this in a small container and then it's mixed with water. So you have to shake it up a little bit. And then just give each plant a spritz of the neem oil before you bring it inside. And that really helps. Plants don't do as well inside as outside in our climate, but you try to find the sunniest place you have. I'm fortunate that I do have a lot of windows on the south side, so my plants do pretty well over the winter. At least they stay alive, and that's my goal. My goal is not great blooms, or sometimes I'm surprised and we have some great blooms, but frequently I just want the plants to stay alive so that they can come back out, and that's what we do. So it's been nice having you with me in the garden today. And let's go inside and see what we can cook with some of the produce that we've had from the garden. Make a nice soup and an apple dessert. Today in the kitchen, we're going to make a simple supper of a hearty soup and an apple dessert. And I'm gonna start with dessert first. I'm making apple crisp today, which is about the simplest apple dish I know. And it's also very tasty and simple to make. I've peeled two cups of apples and put them in a greased casserole dish and I've got my oven on at 350 degrees. I'm going to mix in my mixing bowl one quarter cup of flour, one third cup of brown sugar, and one quarter cup of oatmeal. And this is uh, quick or old-fashioned oats, not the instant oats. And then I want to add some seasoning. And I'll add about a teaspoon of five spice powder. You can use any combination of spices that you'd like, about a teaspoon worth. You can use nutmeg and cinnamon, a uh, little ginger. I like this one because it has uh, a variety of spices in it, some uh, other things that... Uh, add to the flavor. So Chinese five spices, very nice in apple crisp, or any apple dish for that matter, in place of cinnamon and nutmeg. And then three tablespoons of softened butter. And I'm going to mix this with the fork to make some crumbs. This will be our crisp. And just cut this in. You can use a pastry blender if you wish. I use a fork. The idea is just to mix the butter in until you have a nice crumble. The butter's all in smaller pieces. It smells so good when it's mixing. Even now, and it'll smell even better when it hits the oven. You can even use your clean fingers if you wish to make it very evenly crumbled. And then I'm just going to spread this on top of the apples to cover them. The idea is to get the apples covered. 
That's all there is to preparing it. And then it's going into the oven for 30 to 35 minutes. And I'll set my timer for 30 minutes. Again, 350 oven. Now let's start our soup. I'm going to use my larger soup pot for this. Sausage, kale, and bean soup. It's a very hearty soup and it would taste very nice on a cold September evening where it's cooled off and maybe a little rainy and it makes a delicious quick supper. It's not too long to fix. I'm going to start out with the sausage and some olive oil and I want to brown the sausage in about a tablespoon of olive oil. Maybe a little bit more. And I'm using a one pound of sausage, and this sausage was in casings. It was, it's Italian sauce, sweet sausage, and you can get bulk sausage too. I do buy it as links because I might want to use it for a sausage sandwich. So I have it in the freezer, and I can use it either as uh, for sandwiches or remove it from the links. You just squeeze it out from the casings and use it as bulk sausage. It's quite lean and you can break it up as you cook it. And we're going to cook this over high heat until it browns. Take about five minutes or so. I'm breaking it up into smaller pieces as it cooks. You could use turkey sausage, Italian turkey sausage, for this too if you prefer to use a poultry base. Very lean indeed. Turn to the pan so it doesn't have to be fully cooked, just almost the pink red out of the meat. 
and I'm going to remove it to a paper towel covered plate to drain. And I want to move it off the heat a bit. There'll still be a little juice and fat left in the pan. It's perfect. And I may need to add a little more olive oil. This next, we'll scrape the pan a little. Next, I want to add one onion chopped and two cloves of garlic, which have been minced. They were in that same bowl. One half cup of peppers, which are the roasted canned roasted peppers. These were canned roasted fire roasted peppers that I've cut up. They're not hot, they're uh, sweet peppers. You could also probably use your own red peppers that you have roasted if you have them in your garden. And a tablespoon of chopped fresh oregano and a half a tablespoon of chopped rosemary. I'm going to add a little more olive oil to this, just a touch, and we are going to cook this on a little lower heat and until the onions are translucent. Okay, so you can see what's going on in there a little bit, I hope. There we go. You can do it from time to time so you can see it. Since we're doing the video here at my house, I don't have all of the equipment that the TV station has to get a nice close up of the pan. Now that's cooking well and We'll add some further ingredients. We're going to add one quart of chicken broth. And this is a low salt broth, and it comes in one quart package. So that's pretty convenient. That's four cups. And we'll just add the whole thing. Drop. Oh. Then we'll add one can of cannellini beans. These are the white kidney beans, Italian kidney beans, and 14 ounces of tomatoes. Now it calls for a can of canned tomatoes. But I have plenty of cherry tomatoes in the garden and these small plum tomatoes. And I'm going to use those instead. I've quartered those and I weighed them so that I know that I have 14 ounces. So we'll just add that to the pot too. Now we want to bring it to a boil. We're going to return the sausage to it. And I'm going to wait. I'll add a little pepper and salt now. But that got some of the sausage fat out of the sausage. And we're adding the sausage back in. Now I'm going to bring it to a boil and we're going to let it simmer for 10 minutes. Let's add a little salt and pepper right now. We'll add a few grinds of black pepper and a little salt. You can always correct the seasoning when you serve the soup. I'm going to bring this to a boil and I'll show you again what it looks like. I think I can tip it enough that you can see it, maybe. I 
Don't know if you can see that or not, but uh, let's try it. There. We got it. So you can see what's cooking. And we're going to bring it to a boil and then let it simmer for 20 minutes. It's time to take the apple crisp out of the oven and finish our soap. The apple crisp is baked until it's nicely browned, the crumbs, and you should see a little liquid around the edge where the apples have uh, cooked and become tender. If you're not sure if it's finished, just poke the apples with a fork or a knife and you'll see that they're tender. This is going to sit until after we've finished our meal and then it will be just nicely warm. We could add cream or ice cream if you wish or even milk or just eat it plain. Apple crisp makes a nice way to use apples that are not quite fresh and you can use those and make the apple crisp It'll even freeze if you wanted to freeze some apple crisp portions and then take it out and reheat it later on. I'm going to finish the soup by adding two cups of kale. And this kale has been washed and cut in small pieces and the stems cut out. The stems down the middle of the leaf have been removed. We'll add one tablespoon of apple cider vinegar and one half a cup of heavy cream, which is kind of a surprise addition, but it really does make the soup nice and rich and tasty. I'm going to stir this in and let it cook for just a few minutes. I did want to mention that uh, the recipe is a variation and uh, altered amount of a Reed Drummond recipe from, and she is the uh, pioneer woman on TV and online, and it is a version of her recipe. I did change it somewhat. Now we let this again come to a boil, just about, just so that our kale gets cooked a bit. Again, this soup, even with the cream in it, can be frozen and used later on. So you can serve it one night and then have enough left if you have only two people eating it for another meal or freeze it for a meal later on when you're busier and need a quick meal to remove from the freezer and thaw and reheat. Anytime you reheat a food that has been frozen or pre-cooked, you should make sure that it reaches a temperature of about 165 degrees for food safety. And again, don't let things like this cool at room temperature for too long after they've been cooked if you plan to use them later or freeze them for another meal. Now it's started to boil. It doesn't take the kale long to cook very quickly. It's like that. And now we can serve our soup. And I'm going to put it into some soup bowls. You'll see that while we were waiting for it to cook, I set the table. And you'll see it's a nice colorful soup. Pour out two bowls of it. It's nice to serve with a crusty bread, maybe a glass of wine, and some Parmesan cheese shredded over the top, if you wish. It's uh, completely optional. But a nice addition, and people can add it themselves if they wish. I would like to point out our centerpiece today, which is all flowers that were grown in, the, in my garden. Hydrangea, zinnias, uh, dara, uh, verbena, borneriensis, uh, grass, uh, ornamental grasses, and some uh, spiky pieces of amaranth. Uh, it's nice to have some flowers from the garden on the table for these fall meals. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Liz Davey. And join me again on NCTV when we celebrate some Halloween dishes.